welcome into Dog Central After Dark. That's at least what I'm calling this for tonight. Uh, my name is Graham Coffey. This is Dog Central Podcast and YouTube channel. Uh, we are here, as always, to talk about UGA football and athletics, specifically UGA football this week. And uh, yeah, very, very good performance over Kentucky. Um, if you're a Dog Central subscriber, then you've read 12 takeaways. You kind of know my feelings on it, but um, thought it was the result that you've kind of been waiting for from Georgia, sort of the data point that, that we've all needed to say, yes, this team does have uh, uh, another gear. And, and now we've seen that gear on display. So a um, lot to be excited about for there. Uh, I'm going to take some questions tonight. And then I will uh, give you some quick thoughts on the Vanderbilt game. Uh, the advanced stats slash scheme preview that I always do is up and published on dogcentral.com right now in the subscribers forum. So if you want to really, really dive deep into Vanderbilt, um, do that. I'm not going to, I'm going to avoid reading that line by line to you guys tonight, but um, let's get into some subscriber questions because it's been a while since we've taken any. Um, this is a good one from Nash Dog. Uh, how do you think this team looks coming out of the bye week for the Florida game? Health-wise, personnel-wise, and confidence-wise. And he adds that I mentioned some possible changes on D in a recent subscriber update. Yeah, uh, the intel that I'm getting says that you might see some, some more younger guys when Georgia comes out of the bye week. I personally would expect that to be on the the defensive line most likely um look let's let's you know let's be real with it georgia as a team right now is second in the country uh on defense for opponent quarterback rating allowed uh first is penn state second is georgia they're allowing a uh, quarterback rating of low 90s i believe was the the number and that's NFL quarterback rating, not the QBR thing that um, ESPN invented a couple of years ago that has some serious flaws to it. So point being, the secondary is doing its job, and it's really doing its job when you consider the fact that, um, yeah, George is allowing 95.7 quarterback rating on average. Uh allowed a 105.2 quarterback rating last week to compare that to the 2022 team. The 2022 team allowed a 117.8. Now Georgia will face Ole Miss. Uh, they'll face Missouri after the bye week. That will probably bump that number up. They'll face Graham Mertz, who is probably not the guy that's going to really stretch you deep downfield, but from a completion percentage standpoint, he is extremely efficient. Uh, so, Anyways, without getting too far down the wormhole, I guess what I'm trying to drive at is the secondary is doing its job despite the fact that the the defense has struggled to get pressure with four. Uh, and, and that really, really came up last week against the uh, Kentucky Wildcats. I'm trying to find a stat that I put in 12 takeaways, if you'll bear with me for a moment. Um, okay, so... Tramel Walther, Warren Brinson, Nazir Stackhouse, and Michael Williams had a combined pass. They had 20, I'm sorry, 63 pass rush snaps and zero pressures against Kentucky. So they're not they're 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 not getting it done from a pass rush standpoint. Uh and then even from a run defense standpoint, I would say they've been definitely passable, good for the most part, but not great, not kind of what we're used to seeing from Georgia up front, the way that I would describe it from kind of a layman standpoint would be to say like, they're pretty good at not allowing other teams and, and, and the opposing offensive line to take their space, but they're not very good at taking space from other people. And eventually that, that will come back to bite you, especially when you play a better offensive line. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see if Georgia can kind of figure that out a little bit and really get that defensive front to 
threaten some quarterbacks against better offensive lines without the help of, of the inside linebackers. Um, if you take Dumas Johnson and Mondin's pressures out of that Kentucky game, like you're, you're talking very few pressures. George only had 12 pressures in a game where Kentucky not just dropped back to pass a lot, but like we're in a lot of obvious passing situations, a lot of third and longs and, Kentucky is one of the few teams that Georgia is going to play all year that they don't run a bunch of window dressing in terms of like pre-snap motion. They don't run a bunch of misdirection. Like they do run play action. They do run some of those throwback screens, but for the most part, like if you want to tee off on Kentucky as a pass rusher, there's a lot of opportunities in a game where you can just pin your ears back and go. And despite that, you didn't see Georgia get a ton of penetration uh, into the backfield and, and, they really didn't hurry Devin Leary up that much, at least the front four, that is. So coming out of the bye week, I think you're going to see Georgia go with kind of some – right now they're they're playing a defensive line that is very, like, high floor, but maybe a little more low ceiling. And I think that, that will kind of switch a little bit. Like Jordan Hall, uh, he was out there destroying dudes in the fourth quarter of the Kentucky game in the run game as well. We've seen him be part of sort of Georgia's like third down that kind of NASCAR package that they run where they, they put a bunch of pass rushers in and they let them go. Like we, we've seen him do that, but um, I would like to see him more opportunities uh, on standard downs. Kristen Miller has shown that he can be disruptive. Uh, Warren Brinson as well definitely could could be in that conversation. He's had some games this year where, like, I think he had five pressures against South Carolina. So uh, he would be a good option. Jonathan Jefferson potentially is like a rotational piece. Uh, his, you know, he's flashed at times. They got to figure out this edge position, uh, that kind of jack linebacker position in the mint fronts that that Georgia runs, which is basically their their standard defensive package. Um, the Jack is that kind of stand up sort of a uh, linebacker. Occasionally they'll put their hand in their dirt, but that's, that's the old Nolan Smith Aziz Ojolari spot on, on the defensive front. And Chas Chambliss is a, he's a good player. He's a really good kid. He works really hard. Like you get a hundred percent of Chas Chambliss every time he goes on the field, but he has a habit of, sucking inside on certain run plays when he shouldn't. He has a habit of, you know, kind of struggling in coverage. Um, he's not natural in coverage is what I would probably say to be, you know, most fair to him. And I, the, just the reality is, like, from an athletic gift standpoint, he doesn't have some of the things that other guys on this roster have. You have three five-star true freshman edges on your roster with Damon Wilson, Samuel and Pimba and Gabe Harris. Gabe Harris is another one. They, they kind of switched him to becoming more of a true defensive end. Like every time that guy comes into the game, he is physical as shit and he pops people and he gets after the passer. So I think it's time to figure out what you got there. Like Vanderbilt, you might start seeing them kind of take a harder look at some of these guys. I get why they didn't want to do that against Kentucky, especially with the style of Kentucky's run game. But at, at some point you have to like be more disruptive with your front seven. Georgia's havoc rate with their front seven, or I'm sorry. Yeah. With, yeah. With their havoc rate with their front, I believe in the Kentucky game was like 0%. Um, they, they, I mean, that, that's probably not correct. They had one, they had the, the Chambliss tackle for loss in the run game that, that does pop to memory, but like it was pretty limited. And, um, you know, Marvin Jones Jr. is still there and you know, like he's six, six. He is built like a five star. He was a five star. Like you, you have him. And I don't think the issue with him is pass rush as much as it is, although we, haven't really seen him be disruptive as a passer, pass rusher, to be honest with you. But like, we, we know that he should be able to be from a physical gift standpoint, but they got to figure him out um, 
from a run defense standpoint. As far as the bye week stuff uh, coming out of that, like, yeah, I think uh, there's a very good chance they get a Marius Mims back. Um, I think you get probably a close to 100% Lad McConkey. There's other guys on that team that are dealing with injuries that haven't been made public. So I don't, I don't feel like it's my place to, to really share those in this forum. Um, you know, check, check us out over on dog central, uh, behind the paywall. If, if you want to know more about some of that stuff, but like, I, I do think it's, it's fair to say that some of these guys need some time to, to heal up and, and they're going to get that time. So, um, yeah, like I hope that makes sense, but, um, I think you'll have a close to 100% team. I think you'd have Roger, you, you will probably almost certainly have Roderick Robinson back. Um, I mean, Brock Bowers, like that guy, is an animal and he's never going to show like signs of kind of weakness or pain or being slowed by things because he's just such a kind of warrior mentality type player. But um, you don't carry the ball that many times and get that many yards after the catch and after contact in the sec without picking up some, some bumps and bruises. So uh, the bye week will be big for Georgia to kind of get fresh and healthy before it goes on the final stretch of the season. Uh, this show, before we go any further, is promoted and uh, sponsored by Home Field Apparel. Home Field Apparel is our partner at dogcentral.com. They, uh, they support us, so we ask you to support them. They do a fantastic job making throwback shirts, hoodies, uh, all sorts of great stuff. I'm wearing one of their, their cozy hoodies right now. It's wonderful. Uh, exciting news is that they are going to be in Athens for the weekend of the Missouri game, uh, which will be the week after Georgia, Florida, uh, November, November 4th is the Missouri game. And on Friday night, November 3rd, they'll be doing a pop-up shop at the foundry hotel in downtown Athens. And, uh, I will be there and a bunch of other dog central personalities will be there. Uh, Alex Kirshner from split zone duo podcast which is a fantastic podcast like i pay my own uh money to subscribe to their patreon because they they do a very good job and they look at college football and what i think is a pretty unique way uh alex will be kind of moderating and hosting a panel that uh, i will be a part of and uh jim wood from my got a podcast will be there john smith will be there um george foster plans to be there so We'll have a good crew up there to answer your questions and uh, talk about Georgia football, maybe tell some some old stories from uh, past coaching staffs and stuff like that, if if asked. So uh, please check that out. You can uh, go to uh, Graduate Hotel's website and uh, you can actually like kind of pre-register for that event if you if you would like to. And there will also be a lot of like new home field releases uh, that, that have never been seen before. That includes a pretty sick bomber jacket. So get down there, join us. It, it'll be a lot of fun. Um, and please support home field. You can use code dogs central D A W G S central two, three for 20% off on homefieldapparel.com. That is not a code that they give out very much. Um, to home fields, you know, a supporter of college athletics. So they af are affiliated with a lot of great college football media properties, but uh, us and just a couple others uh, get to give out that 20% off. So please take advantage of it and you can use it for like a Colorado Buffaloes t-shirt. If you're trying to ride the Dion wave or a Hawaii rainbow warriors sweatshirt, if Hawaii, uh, Cashes the seventh leg of your parlay at 2.30 a.m. Eastern time, and you you want to, you know, thank them by uh, sending some licensing percentages back their way. So go check out homefieldapparel.com. You will find something there that you like. I can promise you that. Uh, and I got to buy some more of their stuff because my wife keeps stealing all of my home field shirts and hoodies because they are soft and cozy. Uh all right, June recruiting fear monger 
still the best username on dogcentral.com. Asked three breakout players over the second half of the season. All right. Uh, Jordan Hall, previously discussed. Um, let's see. Jordan Hall. I am going to say. I'm going to say Michael Williams. Uh, not that he's not like a a known player at this point. I know that he's a known like commodity, but um, I think Michael is still, you know, kind of been working his way back from the off season injury and hasn't been quite a hundred percent yet. So I'm, I'm going to go with him. And then uh, it would probably be cheating if I said Amarius Mims. But you know that would be a good one. He'll he'll be kind of you know returning back from uh, the the ankle surgery at some point. So to pick one for the offense, I am going to go. I mean, you know, I I think uh, Rara deserves consideration for for that spot. Um, Rara Thomas, you saw what he did against Kentucky. I think he changes Georgia's offense. Uh, having a guy that can turn kind of 50 50 balls into like 80 20s is, is a unique thing and uh, an important thing in college football. So I think Carson Beck has always been a really good like rail shot thrower. Uh, by rail shots, I mean like deep, deep balls down the boundary, you know, 25 plus yard kind of throws down the boundary. Um, and Rara is the perfect guy to throw those two. And, uh, like, I think Carson's so comfortable now. You saw him have 11 pass attempts outside the numbers against Kentucky, which was by far the most he's had this year. Uh, you know, I think he only had four against South Carolina. Like, he's gotten to the point where he trusts his decision-making now. And Georgia's play calling uh, trusts his decision-making enough to where they're letting him kind of let those fly uh, out to the boundary. So. I think it will be – I think Ra-Ra will close this year with a lot of, like, big dynamic plays similar to kind of what you saw from from A.D. Mitchell at times in 2021 and 2022. Like, I think he's that guy that can go and get open and make a play against, like, better opponents when sort of, you know, a lot of your other pass catchers and skill players are struggling to find space. Do you think it goes against Mike Bobo's internal desires to be a pass to set up the run team like we've seen in the last six quarters? Uh, this is from What You Got, Lauren. I I don't think it goes against his internal desires. Like, I mean, Georgia at times when he was the offensive coordinator was, was very much a pass first team, like 2013 comes to mind with, with Aaron Murray. Um, I, I think that Bobo and Georgia as a whole, like is very much a, a group that like whatever game plan they need to run that week to be the best team they can be is usually what they're going to run. Um, I, I think for Mike, you physicality is important to him because it's important to Kirby smart. Um, he's not trying to come in and bring like old school eye form and stuff back into the offense. Although I wouldn't be surprised if Georgia has a package of eye form somewhere in its back pocket that you might see in a, in an interesting spot down the stretch of the season. But I, I think for Bobo, the, the truth of the matter is, is really that he, he wants to, be able to possess the football when, when you need to, when you need to be able to run clock, when you, you know, like the reason that I think Georgia came out running the football against Auburn is a, they thought they'd be able to, and they, they weren't right. And, and I, and I was critical after that game of not the fact that they wanted to run first, but the, the, where they were trying to run the football didn't make much sense to me in terms of trying to, to be, I think, you know, a little too focused on running up the middle in the interior out of some tighter sort of formations. Like Georgia has been better running the ball out of spread personnel this year. That I mean, like that, that's what they have done most easily. And I also think that Georgia has done kind of their, their best work 
uh, in the run game when when they vary things enough between zone and gap. And and a lot of times in that gap scheme, you see them getting outside the tackles. Uh, you know those those pulling guards, like a lot of those gap plays are usually either going to go outside or if they do come inside, sometimes that's a, a cutback type play. So I think that, you know, Bobo is fine with being a, a pass to set up the run type team, as long as like there's still some kind of body blows being delivered. And I think that's why you saw what you saw on so, uh, the opening kind of drives against Kentucky, where you saw the swing passes and you saw the, uh, like the the swing screens to uh, Dominic Lovett and the the swing passes to Dejan and some of that, I think those are extensions of the run game. Like that, that's how the offense looks at them. They those yards go on Carson Beck's stat sheet, but they they you know it is a forward pass, but they do look at that much more, I believe, as a a run play in terms of how they're kind of like looking at their percentages of play calls and such. I think that, you know, any coaches are competitive people. And uh, in a program like Georgia that prides itself on physicality, I think sometimes there is this idea of like, we're, we want to go in and we want to win games by ramming the ball down your throat because in a way that's an indicator that like the staff has done their jobs and achieved what they want to achieve. Uh, the reality is that like, that's not always what modern football looks like. Georgia does that more than a lot of people, but um, you know, for this particular offensive line, I think that success much more often looks like getting those big guys and getting them on the edge, getting them downfield, getting them into space as funny as that sounds for an offensive line and letting them use their athleticism because that's, that's the gift that this group on the whole has, I think is a unique combination of mobility and size. Um, They have a lot of size and a lot of Georgia offensive lines under Kirby smart have had a lot of size, but this one is particularly well suited to moving. So um, I, I, I hope that answers your question. I, the answer in my mind is no, but I do think that, you know, the being able to hold the ball, deliver body blows, embark on long drives, stay ahead of the chains, all of that is important to Mike Bobo and, and probably to Kirby Smart as well and to any, you know, offensive coordinator or staff that's worth its salt. But I think that, for these guys, they, they don't really care if it's achieved, you know, in the traditional sense, as long as it's achieved. So, and that, that's what we saw against Kentucky, at least. I mean, uh, I don't know that you'll learn much about this offense against Vanderbilt. Remember as you watch this game and you're tempted to tweet about Mike Bobo, that Georgia likes to use these games to practice basically what it's not good at you know like they use these games to hone and refine and perfect things that need perfecting um so yeah you might see a bunch of inside zone on saturday in nashville and looking at vandy's run defense they should be able to hit it this could be a get right game for that interior of the the uga offensive line but um i wouldn't draw any big philosophical kind of broad-based conclusions off of what the first quarter game plan or opening script looks like against Fandy. All right. Which teams would GGA not want to face in a playoff scenario? Seeing how we have struggled against QB runs and passes to the sidelines, Alabama immediately comes to mind. That's from Jay Bowman. Uh, Yeah, I mean, like the quarterback run thing has been an issue for Georgia, for sure. Um Despite that, like like we said earlier, I mean, I, I think the interior of Georgia's run defense has been very good. Like the, the defensive tackles have been very good. Um, the inside linebackers have been almost very good. There's 
been a couple times where they've gotten gapped up the middle, but not much. It's the edges where they struggle and, and have struggled so far this year. Uh, I do think, you know, you look at Georgia giving up 98 rush yards a game, which is 17th in the nation. That is a little behind where you would expect them to be considering the, the teams that they have faced. I, you know, I, Alabama does have the quarterback run part of that. I just, I don't think Alabama's offensive line is really like capable of dominating Georgia um, in, in a significant way. I think Georgia's secondary can hold up against almost anybody. Uh, I would worry about Dalen Everett. And I might not six games from now when we get to the end of the regular season and, you know, get to the SEC championship. He may be a very different player. He will certainly almost almost certainly be a different player because of how young he is. But he's a bit unproven against, like, top-level receivers. You saw what Xavier Leggett was, was able to kind of do against him and give him troubles. So I think the answer is that playing elite quarterback-wide receiver combos – put a certain level of variance into a football game. That's just way harder to account for. And it's way less predictable. So like, I wouldn't want to see Michael Penix and his three NFL wide receivers. Um, you know, he's not really the quarterback run threat, but like they are an elite and precise enough passing game to where they could stress Georgia's defense without really like, being that good on the ground, you know, um, they don't have to run for 200 to be, I think, painful to defend. Uh, I would honestly say the number one team that I wouldn't want to see if I was Georgia is Oregon. And it's just because you beat the ever living dog shit out of them to open the season last year. Um, Kirby made that comment of like, we've got better players than they do, which I'm sure would come back up and be played for a month straight going into a playoff. You know, um, I also think that like Dan Lanning has a good knowledge of your system and, and your, you know, the inner workings of your program. And, you know, if, if he does X, you're probably going to do Y. Like he, there's a level of predictability that, he probably possesses that most staffs don't have when it comes to Georgia. So I wouldn't want to see Oregon as far as Alabama. I think like, I think you kind of want to see them. I would rather see Alabama's offense than LSU's offense in Atlanta. If I was, a, you know, defensive staff, I, don't, I think that's a no brainer. Like Alabama has a quarterback who is growing and coming into his own and, and Milrow is certainly improving, but like, He's not going to consistently carve you up with tight window throws. So you're basically playing a game of like deep ball roulette. And I like Malachi Starks and Javon Bullard in cover two over the top of Jermaine Burton with, with, you know, Lassiter probably matched up with him most of the time. Like I like George's odds of winning that battle of kind of 50, 50 balls. And I also, don't think Alabama's offensive line is is that great. Uh, Jace McClellan's a good back, but he is not Derrick Henry or Najee Harris or, you know, he's not Mark Ingram. Shit, he's not even Damian Harris. Like, he's a good back, but he's not, you know, a, I don't know that he's a future NFL starter like a lot of these guys that we've seen in the past in, in Crimson, so – from a personnel standpoint, I think Georgia matches up pretty well with them. But the reality is you get to that point in the season, you're going to play a lot of good teams, and all of those good teams are going to have certain players that can stress you. But the you know LSU's defense is definitely not what Alabama's is. But I think Georgia's offense is kind of on a trajectory to where if it keeps progressing like it's doing right now, like Carson Beck could – get to a spot where he can kind of get what he does on everybody. 
you know, I'm not saying he's going to throw for 300 in the first half every week like he did against Kentucky, but like I think he's good enough to go out there every week and pretty much execute what Georgia wants to do within reason. And I mean, Georgia's very, very like from a success rate standpoint, even uh, when this offense was kind of like struggling, so to speak, against South Carolina and Auburn, they've been very efficient all year. They stay on schedule. They they stay, you know, in front of the chains. The only time that's really not happened was uh, for a couple quarters at, at Auburn. They and that was because of the run game, really, not the passing game. So, point being, I, I don't think uh, there's a defense out there right now that would really shake me too bad if I was Georgia at this moment because I think by the time you get to December, this thing might be humming along. I mean, Georgia's offensive success rates in the first and second quarter against Kentucky were higher than they were in the first and second quarter against TCU in the, the 65-7 to de-pantsing in the national championship game. So, like, what, what does that tell us? It tells us that this offense is really good and it's rolling along. What concerns do you have recruiting wise? Maybe taking off the journalist hat and putting the fan hat on. Um, I would be concerned. I mean, how's Georgia won back to back national championships? There's a long answer and a complicated answer to that. And but the short answer is that they've won those titles by being better than everybody else on the line of scrimmage. Um, they are more physical than you on the line of scrimmage. They can two gap. I think that's you know, the, the defensive scheme, if you want to explain the magic of what Georgia does. So they two gap like one guy can play two gaps and that requires really good linemen and they're not doing that as well <clears throat> so far this year as they were last year, particularly at the D end and edge positions, uh, th those kind of bookend positions in their four down looks. So, I mean, they've got, like we said earlier, they got three five star kind of edge ish players on on the roster in the pipeline, but you want big guys and there's you can find productive wide receivers anywhere, you can find productive running backs anywhere, you can find productive quarterbacks way down the list. Hell, you know, hello, Stetson Bennett, two star walk on. Um you cannot just, you know, kind of pluck like elite defensive tackles. Those guys are usually five stars when they come out of high school and they stay that way. There are Jordan Davises that come out around and, and George is very good at identifying the traits that, you know, they, they want to potentially develop a guy like that down the road, but it's, it's a lot harder and the hit rate is, is a lot lower. So that's my answer there. Okay, three trends I noticed in the Kentucky game were that were are, are effective. Uh, Carson slinging it and easily passing 300 yards. Rob Rob Thomas getting more catches and targets, and Dejan Edwards receiving the ball out of the backfield. Uh, you ran out of characters for my screen, but to finish the question here, it said. Do you expect these three to continue, or were they more specific game plans to make Kentucky uncomfortable? Uh, I expect those things to all continue. Like, I think this is always where Georgia was going, but they they had to build up to it with a new quarterback. And you guys, if you followed my work, you know, like I have the long con theory about uh, Georgia football in particular. You know, on the whole, it, it kind of started with Todd Monken, but like Georgia's not too keen on just like running a bunch of fancy plays that they don't have to run to win a football game. Like they're going to run what they need to run to get out with a win, but they're not putting, you know, touchdown plays on tape against Mississippi state. Like they're not putting their best red zone stuff on tape against South Carolina. Um, you know, there are times where they get into a close game and they have to hit the gas, but on the whole, like, I think this Kentucky game plan was sort of finally saying like, we are going to play a complete football game and, and we're going to sort of start, you know, hitting our true form. And I think the, the personnel, the players have a higher level of self-belief than they did a few weeks ago. And that's 
one of those things that you can't measure, but you can you can see it on the field. You can see it in the way that they came out and played that game. You can see how comfortable Carson Beck was compared to how he looked against South Carolina, where you know it was like he wanted to get the ball out of his hands almost as quickly as possible within reason. And, you know, he wasn't always going through his reads and progressions or looking at his deep routes. So I think all those things are going to be tenants of this offense. Who are three defensive linemen you think we'll see more of? Christian Miller, Jordan Hall, and MJJ come to mind first for me. Yeah, they come. I mean, they come to mind first for me as well. Um, We kind of talked about that in the first question, but uh, the one that I would – add to that would be uh you know brinson has been pretty productive but he's not really like a a quote-unquote starter at the moment so i'd like to see some more of him uh yeah brinson has played he's played 163 snaps all right that's wrong uh yeah he has actually played more snaps than almost any of the other linemen. So scratch that. Um, I, you know, I wish Jamal Jarrett was healthy because he's flashed when he's, when he's been in there, but from the, to, to put in a, another name out there that, that you didn't name in your question, I will, I'll go back to Gabe Harris. That dude is a football player and he can, he can go. So I would like to see him. How do you compare UGA at this point in the season to what they were at the same point last season? Um, mm, I think the ceiling for the team is probably higher than it ever was for the 2022 team. Now, at this point last year, like you had the 49 to three win against Oregon on the opening weekend. And that was, that was impressive, right? Like that was a data point that kind of told you like from the word go, like, this team can be very, very good. I think this defense, you don't have Jalen Carter up front, but I think your secondary is better. Uh, I I think like you, you have more talent in the back end. And the reality is that when it gets down to, to cut in time in the college football playoff, like, yes, you, you need someone to pressure those quarterbacks. Um, and that's still, I think a, up in the air a little bit for Georgia right now, but you feel pretty good about Georgia's secondary going up against almost anyone they could face. Um, again, like Washington's got those wide receivers that would, that would stress anybody. They would stress those three receivers would stress NFL secondaries right now. You know, I'm not saying Washington would beat an NFL team. They would not, they would get their shit blown out, but, um, Georgia, if they find a pass rush with their front four, all of a sudden that defense becomes very dynamic. On offense, I think people don't ever realize this when they look back on seasons where a championship was won, but Georgia's run blocking hasn't started the year off crisply since – in, in in years, I mean, like they they were not a good run blocking team to start 2022. They were not a good run blocking team to start 2021. Uh, they're still figuring that out in 2023. You saw against Kentucky what that can look like. I think having Kendall Milton back and with some burst is bigger than a lot of people realize. Um, you know, Dajan is Dajan. I think you'll get Roderick Robinson back. That can be kind of a a good trio to where you feel more comfortable running the ball in traditional ways and, you know, less dependent on swing passes and screens. Although I think those are still an important part of the offense because it like you want to stretch teams horizontally and vertically and, you know, get them leaning and, and then take advantage of the, the leverage opportunities that, that creates. So, uh, yeah, long story short, I think they're on a good track. Uh, the 2022 team, they had the Mizzou game. I think for this team, the, the comp would be the, the, uh, I'm sorry, not the Missouri game, the Auburn game, but 
you still had that South Carolina performance in there, and that was bothersome, I think, because Georgia was not explosive in the past game and they didn't finish in the red zone. I, at this point, would attribute that more to inexperience and youth and having a, a quarterback in his first SEC start than I would like any sort of fatal flaw. But it's it's one good performance from the offensive line. Like, you want to see a lot more, you know. Uh, you want to see them come out in Florida, in Jacksonville, and do similar things. So the jury is still out, but I think that Georgia has the potential to go all the places that they want to go. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. All right. So let's talk a little about UGA Vanderbilt here. Um So Georgia's going to Nashville on Saturday. And I mean, Vanderbilt, what I see, I'll I'll share some of my kind of notes that, that I shared in the advanced stat scheme preview. And it's a Vanderbilt game that Georgia is going almost certainly going to win. Uh so you know, I'm I'm not gonna give you guys like a 30 minute breakdown of it, but there were some things that I did think were interesting. Uh you know, you, you've got Ken Seal starting for Vandy now instead of A.J. Swan, which I I think if you wanted – look, Vanderbilt's not going to win this game, but if they wanted their best chance to win this game, I think you would probably play A.J. Swan. But your, your best chance to really get blown out in a very embarrassing way is also to play A.J. Swan because he's a poor decision maker and he – throws the ball into bad windows. He tries to force the ball like 20 plus percent of his dropbacks so far this season have been 20 plus yard throws. Uh, whereas seals is a little more like 9%. Um, so he forces it downfield into coverage. He trusts his arm too much. Like all the things that a young big arm quarterback tends to do, he does, but that arm talent does have a higher chance of like actually hitting an explosive play against Georgia and the talent on Georgia's defense that could flip the field. Vanderbilt needs explosive plays to score. Uh, they're not a very good like success rate offense. They are also not a very good team in terms of their, their run game. Like the run game is a struggle bus. Like what was the stat? Um, Okay, yeah, so Florida's defense, which is, I think, a good unit, you know. Uh, I think Georgia's a more talented unit, but, like, Florida's Florida's a pretty good defense. But Florida's defense created a Havoc play on almost 30% of their snaps against Vanderbilt. That's, that's, that's a very high number. That's basically three out of every ten offensive snaps for Vanderbilt against Florida was either a tackle for a loss, uh, like a pass deflection or breakup, an interception or a sack. Um, and most of that 30% was tackle for a loss in the run game. Like this offensive line has struggled so much to run block that here's the stat I wanted to give you guys. So the leading rusher is only averaging 4.2 yards a carry, but 297, or I'm sorry, 246 of his 297 yards this season have come after contact. Um, it's just like that's not, you know, that's that's basically, you know what? I got a typo in there somewhere. I'm sorry. Either way, 1.3 yards before contact per carry is what he's averaging, uh, according to my math, which, which is not much. Um, the run game, you know, 54 yards on 19 carries against Mizzou and most of that yardage was on jet sweeps. Like they're not going to run the ball on Georgia. This is a, a chance for Georgia to have a get right game as a run defense. That means they got to bomb it away. Uh, they do have two superb wide receivers, Will Shepard. Uh, I would say superb might be too strong of a word. Will Shepard is a superb wide receiver. Jaden McGowan is a very good wide receiver, but he struggles to produce at times against SEC teams. Smaller slot guy at 5'8". Shepard is Shepard could could play anywhere in the conference and be a, a, a big contributor on any team in the league. Um, 15.7 yards a catch, 550 yards, eight touchdowns. 
27 of his 35 catches have gone for first downs. He is a bona fide stud. He put 98 yards on to Kentucky. He put 107 on to Florida last week. Um, I'm sorry, Kentucky actually held him in check. 10 targets, two catches for 31 yards. He put 98 on Mizzou. I apologize. Not reading very well this afternoon or this evening. Um, but yeah, I think Georgia's offense should get what it wants in this game. Like to give you an idea of how poorly uh, Vanderbilt's back end tackles. So Florida's offense last week had, or I'm sorry, Mertz. Let's just go on Mertz alone. Mertz had 254 passing yards. His average depth of target was only 1.8 yards. So. Like I, I've, I've never seen anything quite like that when doing these like deep dive previews that I do for the website. Mertz was only pe- pressured on five dropbacks. I only had four attempts of over ten yards in the entire game, and just like in- incredible. Uh, Vandy's inside linebackers are terrible in pass coverage. Apparently, Florida targeted them twenty one times. And they allowed 17 receptions, uh, only 134 yards passing. So, I mean, like they rallied to the football. Okay, I guess. But uh, Vandy missed nine tackles after the catch in this football game. Like the tackling in the back end was really bad. That's how you get 254 yards passing when your your average of the target was only 1.8 yards. So I look at that and I'm like, Dude, Brock Bowers on a flat route could rip for a 65-yard touchdown at any point in time. Um, Georgia's screen game should have the potential to have a really nice afternoon. Uh, Like, yak, 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 right? Yards after the catch. Now, that is the route that Florida took, but Missouri went more like bombs away on them. Um, Brady Cook had 17 throws of over 10 yards and completed 14 of them for 251 yards and four touchdowns point being in the past game, you can get them short. You can get them deep. There's really not, I think much resistance that's going to be presented to Georgia in this football game on Saturday afternoon from a a defensive uh, secondary kind of standpoint. Vandy's defensive line is Okay, I guess. I mean, you know, I mean, like Florida. Florida had runs of 43, 34, 28, 25, 14, and 11 yards. And all of those runs came in different gaps. So, you know, no, they're probably not okay. Like Florida's Florida's got a really good run game, to be fair. But um, what's interesting, we were having the conversation earlier in the show about inside runs versus outside runs, gap scheme versus zone. I mentioned earlier that Georgia uses games like this often to kind of practice things that it feels like it needs to be better at. See 2022 Kentucky, where they just smashed into the line over and over on short yardage and only scored 16 points. Um, Like Florida last week, they had 12 carries in the A gaps and B gaps, so inside the tackles. And those attempts gained 137 yards. So 11.4 yards a carry on inside the tackle runs for Florida in that game. And they averaged over eight yards a carry on the whole in that football game. Um, My point here being Georgia should be able to run the ball up the middle in this game in a way that they, they haven't much this season. Um, I think, you know, I'm interested to see exactly how Georgia tries to attack them because I think they can kind of do whatever they want. I think that probably means you're going to see a lot of like pretty vanilla offense. Uh, but I still think that the I, part of the identity of this team at this point is like, like you need to continue some of what you established last week. Like you need to continue throwing the ball outside the numbers. You need to continue stretching the field vertically with your passing attack. So I don't think they'll totally go into a shell and get like, you know, just super, super boring. Um, Kirby like uses these kind of 
games against lesser opponents to work on things, but he does seem to treat Vanderbilt a little bit differently than he does some like the outer conference opponents. I think part of that is them being an SEC opponent. Part of that is the 2021 or the 2020 game that they canceled at the end of the season where it cost Georgia's senior class a chance at being the most winning class in school history um, in the COVID year. Like he put 62 on them in 2021 in Nashville. I think they were up 38, nothing in halftime of that game. They put 55 on them last year. Um, Georgia was up big in that game early as well. I expect Georgia to come out and play hard early and play well and then give some guys a look after after halftime. But, yeah, I mean, last year they were up 28 nothing at half, and they really didn't play that well in the first half. So, Georgia, uh, I mean, one piece of action that I'm on in this game, Georgia is only favored by 20 on the first half line. I'm, I'm taking that. I'm on Georgia minus 20. Um, Vanderbilt scoring is really going to come down to like, can they hit a big pass play or two? Because I just don't think they can march down the field on Georgia's defense with what they have. I think Shepard, if they can get him on Everett, he can he can catch a couple. Um, but, you know, even then, Georgia's defense is always phenomenal at like, not allowing your explosive plays to be touchdowns. So I don't know. Vanderbilt will probably get some points in. Maybe those points will come late against the the, the backups or something. Um, but I think Georgia is going to run away with this one. I got Georgia 52, Vandy 6. We'll see what happens. Uh, I do have some other plays for you guys if you want them um, for the weekend on the gambling front. Uh, all right, let me, let me throw these up here real quick. So for Friday night, I got, bam, let's see if this works. Not quite like I wanted to. That's okay. I got Utah state plus four and a half at home against Fresno state. That line stinks to me. Fresno is a, a very good football team. They were undefeated before last weekend against Wyoming. Um, Utah State has was kind of struggling early in the year. They switched quarterbacks like a week ago, and that kid seems to be rolling pretty good. Uh, this line is just one of those that it's almost kind of like a system play for me where I, I see lines that don't really make sense. Um, I usually hit them, and I'll you know, I would say I, I would be tempted to, to just bet Utah State on the money line here because I feel like that's kind of what this line is saying. Um, so I put that on there as well. They're they're plus one sixty two on the money line, which is a, a profitable odds for a four and a half point dog. Um, Stanford plus eleven and a half at Colorado. I, it's just a weird feeling I got about that one. Uh, don't have any great analysis for you. I have watched a lot of Colorado. I think Stanford can score on them. I think Colorado has been on a long run of, of tough physical games. They're coming back from an away game in the desert at Arizona State on short rest. Playing at home should invigorate them, but Stanford is well coached. They're a better team than most realize, and I think they'll score some points and keep this thing close enough to cover the 11 and a half. I also like the Stanford team total over 20, 20, 22 and a half points. Uh, same logic there. I think they'll score some points. Let's go to Saturday. We got a good slate on Saturday. I'm excited about it. We'll start. Uh, I, I've got Arkansas plus 19 and a half at Alabama. This just feels like one of those weekends where you got Arkansas playing at Alabama. So, you know, Bama plus 19 or favored by almost 20 at home. That line is doing weird things. Like there's a lot of uh, more money on. Uh, there's a lot more money that is on Bama than Arkansas. But that line moved towards Arkansas. 
I just I think Vegas knows something that that I don't know or you don't know. So I'll take Arkansas plus nineteen and a half. Uh, I think KJ Jefferson is one of the more underrated players in the SEC. He can kind of just go off at any point in time. Like he has the athletic superiority to make a forty-five yard touchdown run happen, or you know, bomb away. Uh, I think Alabama big win on the road at AM might not be totally checked in for this one until the second half. So give me the hogs, uh, Purdue at home with Ohio state coming to town. Also a 19 and a half point favorite. Give me them as well. I don't hate the idea. If you're some like, I like to take three or four money line flyers every Saturday, you know, put like, a quarter of a unit on each and usually one of those will hit and you know i'll i'll make a couple to three units off of that uh i don't hate a little money line flyer on purdue plus 19 and a half or arkansas plus 19 and a half of that you know it's a flyer it's just a little sprinkle you know put five or ten bucks on it don't go betting 50 on it but I feel like somewhere in the college football universe between those two games and Florida state favored by 17 and a half at home, you know, I don't know. There's been a lack of upsets this season, but you started to see some dominoes fall last week. I bet you see one of those three teams go down. I just, I feel like you'll see either Florida state Purdue. I'm sorry, Florida state, Alabama or Ohio state, uh, fall by the wayside this week. I could be wrong about that, but it'll be fun to find out. And you got Michigan. They've got Indiana. Indiana's not good enough to to knock them off, so don't worry about that one. Um, I believe Oklahoma is off this week. They are. So those are the teams I would watch, the three we talked about earlier. Uh, like I said, I got UGA minus 20 first half at Vanderbilt. And then I have Oregon plus three at Washington. I picked Washington to go to the playoff. If you recall, way back in August, I was ahead of the curve on Washington. I made a lot of money betting Washington. I've ridden the wave. I think Oregon gets them this week and is able to turn this into a line of scrimmage football game. And then I think Washington will beat Oregon in Las Vegas in the big 12 title game to go to the college football playoff, avenge their only loss. But this week, give me Oregon plus three Kansas at Oklahoma state. I'm taking Oklahoma state plus three, the pokes, uh, Mike Gundy, man. I know a lot of people don't like him or they got strong opinions about him or whatever, but you give that dude half a season and he'll, He'll find something in his team that works. He's found something that's that's starting to work for this football team, and they beat a Kansas State team that's that's good. Like Chris Kleiman is an excellent coach. I took them down this week, so um, good on them. Texas A and M at Tennessee uh, under fifty five in that one. I, I just I don't think there should be very many points there. There's some weather in the forecast for Knoxville, which makes me like that line even more, but I liked it to begin with. Um, Pitt plus seven and a half at Louisville. That line stinks, man. It does. There's like Louisville just beat Notre Dame. They're six and zero, oh, pomp and circumstance and fans there. And you're telling me that a Pittsburgh team that's won one game is only a seven and a half point dog. I'll, I'll bite. And you should probably just, say F it and money line that thing as well. Um, let me make myself a note to do that. Thank you Wyoming plus 11 and a half at air force. I've been on the pokes since week one. I had a viral tweet about Wyoming football that I did not expect to go crazy, but, uh, like, you know, like Dennis Dodd retweeted it for some, it was just cool. I Dennis Dodd seems like a cool guy. Um, Anyways, the point is, I I think Wyoming is a hard nose, scrap it out kind of team. Air Force, obviously, uh, they they run the ball a lot, and they're they're going to continue doing that. But um, 
I think Wyoming's run defense is good enough. I don't know if they can win this game. Like, I think they could, but I, I don't think they will necessarily. But I think that Wyoming will – this is the G5 game of the year so far, truthfully. I mean, right now Wyoming is in the catbird seat in terms of the uh, New Year's Six situation. If they were able to pull this off, they would truthfully have the inside track towards uh, being in one of those college football playoff bowls, which I would love to see. But I don't know that they do it, but I do think they cover the 11 and a half. I like Craig Bowl. He's a great coach, and Wyoming just kind of plays a style that tends to shorten games and keep them close. And then they they try to make a play late in the in the game, whether that be a turnover on defense or or drive on offense. But they'll deliver body blows. They'll run the ball, and then and then they pop a late. So don't give up on Wyoming if they're down a little early. They have a habit of of winning games like that. Auburn at LSU. I thought about going the other way on this, and then, look, man, I think that win that LSU had on the road at Missouri last week, the way that that win kind of played out, how they how they looked in that game in terms of being down 22-7, to seven, a lot of things going wrong, Jaden Daniels looking beat up. Like, the, the seams were starting to – stretch a little bit and then they pulled it back together made some nice adjustments on defense in the second half you know but everyone talked about what they gave up which is fair i mean that defense has really struggled this year but they did figure it out so give me lsu minus 11 and a half i think that they start hot stay hot finish hot um that offense is going to score some points. The Auburn defense is good, but LSU is going to score points. And I just don't know that even against, you know, LSU's defense hasn't been good this year, but like Auburn hasn't really been good throwing the ball against anybody. And that tends to be what LSU has struggled to defend has been the, uh, you know, the, the pass. So I, I just don't think even against a bad pass defense that Auburn's going to be able to pass the ball much. I'm sure it'll look more competent than it did against Georgia where they just basically try to run a high school offense. And, and hell, it almost worked for them. But uh, I think LSU covers the 11 and a half. Miami plus three and a half at North Carolina. I'm taking Miami. I know they – I made fun of Mario Cristobal all week. You did too, as you should. Um, UNC coming off a blowout win over a Syracuse team. That, that's a good football team. Came into that game with just one loss. Makes no sense for this line to only be three and a half points. I want to be on the Miami side of it in that scenario. Uh, final bet, I got Colorado State plus seven and a half uh, at home against Boise State in the late night slate. I. I like that one. Uh, Boise struggled this year. Colorado State, they're always that team that's like supposed to be the ascendant G5 team, and they, they never quite get there. But I think Jay Norvell has got them moving in the right direction. I'll I'll pay to take the ride. Uh, quick prop bet, I got Dominic Lovett for an anytime touchdown. That's plus 265 at Caesars. It's good odds. I, I think, you know, he's been a little quiet the last couple of weeks. I could see them wanting to get him involved on Saturday. And then other money line flyers I'm in on Syracuse plus 625 at FSU, Purdue plus 720, as we previously discussed, against Ohio State. And then give me Kent State, the Golden Flashes plus 270 on the road at Eastern Michigan to get their first victory of the season. Um, that's what I got for you guys tonight. I appreciate you joining in on the show. Thank you for subscribing to the website. If you don't subscribe to the website, then you should. You're missing out on a ton of intel. Um, literally, we tell you guys what's going to happen every single week. We say these guys are going to play. These guys aren't. Those are the guys that play. Those are the guys that don't play. Like. I'm not trying to sound like an asshole or toot my own horn there, but like we work really, really hard to cultivate sources and to 
get the right information and we're doing that. So, you know, come, come and subscribe to dog central. You're, you're missing out if you're not there. So thank you guys for tuning in and come find us on dogcentral.com and we'll see you next week.